Hello and welcome back to another edition of Now You Know. I'm your host, Dale Wilson. We're filming from the sunny downtown Port Angeles studios at Papa. Today our special guest is one of my favorite guests. It's John Mars, John, Dr. John Mars, beg your pardon. He's been with us a couple of times and is always informative and entertaining. And today we're gonna to talk a little bit about local politics as we always do. And especially with the two very important uh, elections, with several very important elections coming up, but two uh, especially important that we're going to hopefully hit on today. And that is the uh, commissioners, uh, two out of the three commissioners for the Port of Port Angeles will be elected in November and four out of the seven uh, city council people for the city of Port Angeles will be up for election. So John, that's an awful lot to be looking forward to in just a few short months. Uh, it's, of course, we don't have any uh, uh, candidates yet, so it's going to be very difficult to handicap the race, but what are some of the issues that we should be looking for? Well, the issues that I've been most concerned about are basically leadership issues. Uh, I What's think, that? <clears throat> well, you know, <clears throat> leadership is a big topic, of course, but there's a lot of, uh, we've had a lot of uh, things come before the city council that they have excused themselves from participating in those matters on the basis that it's not their direct responsibility. But there are issues like the school bond, Wild Olympics, uh, and, uh, and a couple of other things that escape my m mind at the moment that they sh could step up and provide leadership on. They could provide leadership pro or con. Right, right. But they haven't taken any position. And, and, that, and that's one of the things I'm thinking of. Uh, the fluoride issue, of course, was an outstanding example of a uh, woeful leadership, uh, an attempt at leadership that was really manipulative. And in the end, it was positively resolved by the mayors Mayor Downey's decision to uh, to act positively in terms of what the fluoridation, the anti-fluoridation outcome had been in the survey. Let me but they muddled their way around a whole lot. That doesn't that doesn't bode well for the future of the city. Let me circle back on, on what I think you're talking about. The advisory vote that wasn't. Right. Uh, so the uh, city council uh, agreed to have an advisory vote to determine if the city residents wanted to continue having uh, fluorosilic acid added to the water. And as most people will realize or remember, the vote came out extraordinary, 64, 65% against fluoridation. Mm -hmm. And then the city council in its eminent um, wisdom decided to continue fluoridation. So uh, two things went bad there. First of all, having an advisory vote for which they would not take the results and then uh, going ahead and, and against the will of the people uh, continuing fluoridation. So I agree well, that's they, not much leadership. They, they argued basically that the survey, their own survey wasn't set up very well and so they decided that the results weren't meaningful and so they ignored the results because the results weren't what they wanted to do. Well I think one council... And that's, a, that's not a good example of leadership. One council member even suggested that those that stayed home were voting for continued fluoridation. Those yes, that did right. not vote. That's right. So, that's so right. all of those that stayed right. home uh, can, can I count my, if I run for office, all those that don't vote, can I count them for me? <laughs> <laughs> there, are, there are also members of the council who, uh, who are vote counters. Uh, they won't take a position on something unless they are sure that their position is going to win. And if their position is not going to win, they'll either uh, keep their mouth shut or do something else. And, and that's not leadership either. Isn't that a little spineless? Well, I think it's spineless. I mean, people run for office saying, this is who I am, this is what I believe, this is how I will... Uh, conduct myself in, in uh, public affairs, they don't mention that they're going to uh, put a uh, finger to the wind to see which right. way the wind is blowing. Right, right. Uh, John, is there any limit to that? I mean, it's not just city and county and oh, state. No. It's, it goes all the way it, up and down it, the line. It goes all over the place. Um, and it, you know, it goes into Congress, too, but that's a, that's a much larger s subject and a lot more people involved there. Uh, I am optimistic in this coming city council election that there are going to be some uh, cogent, bright young people running, and it's going to, and we're going to get the old boys out of office. Keep, uh, hopefully, keep Lee Wedham. Uh, I'm hoping that he will run for re-election. Thank you. I agree. And then we have th three incumbents who are who are not up for election, and so if Lee gets the uh, uh, company of three young new blood and Sissy Brook. They could swing the majority of the council in favor of more progressive attitude. I, I agree, and Michael Meredith is doing a good job there. I think this is his second year in, uh, so there would be some uh, uh, continuity there. Sissy's been mm -hmm. there a few mm -hmm. years, of course. Uh, Deputy Mayor 
Uh, Kid has been there a few years. Uh, in fact, I think she's on her third four-year term in, in the second year of that. So uh, there would be plenty of institutional memory there. So uh, a slate of three new uh, young, hopefully progressive-minded, could really turn this city around. Yeah, yeah. And I know they're, I know they're out there, and I know they're thinking about running. Can you break some news today and give us a couple of names? I don't know that I'm at liberty to do that. I didn't think you would. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's been several banded around, and I'm like you. I would not uh, produce their names until they're ready because right, yeah. it, uh, they can create all. They, first yeah. of all, once they uh, list their intent to run, then they have to start file, uh, right. filling out all of this paperwork right. Right. and uh, in releasing all of this financial yeah. information. Yeah. You, uh, in an recent article that you uh, published, you were talking about the uh, term vetting candidates and how that term came about. Tell, tell the viewers how oh, that term came about. It's pretty basic. In the, somewhere along the line, they were using veterinarians to check out horses for horse races to make sure that, that the vets, uh, that the horses were healthy enough to be running. And uh, so the term got shortened to vet, and it became the, the term we use today, the verb to vet, uh, meaning to, uh, to study, to analyze, to, uh, to uh, uh, ask questions of people and candidates to make sure that they're okay and copacetic. And, and the interesting thing about it is that it comes from the horse race venue, and our media, especially our national media today, love to treat all, all politics as a horse race. And so it's very apt. Well, you know, I, this this seems like the, this last presidential race that, that we endured, it seems like the longest presidential mm -hmm. race that I have ever lived through when I'm yeah. in my 60s yeah. now. And did it seem like to you, and, and, and I haven't done the study on it, but I'm sure someone has, did it seem like to you that uh, President Trump, then candidate Trump, got 75% of face time oh, during that? He got an awful lot of time. The, the television media in, in particular, the commercial television medium, is, uh, is wedded to ratings and what they think is bringing the eyes to their product mm -hmm. and their, their judgment over and over again was that Donald Trump was the most interesting candidate running that he was getting the most eyes, the most attention. Well, he so was, he's a train wreck. Him. You couldn't, so you couldn't take care of here's, here's one of the things that uh, just brought the whole uh, coverage, national coverage, to, to uh, light for me. Uh, they, there was at least five to 10 minutes that the uh, CNN had a camera on an empty pulpit waiting Donald Trump to show up when uh, Bernie Sanders was delivering a, a yeah. very important speech elsewhere, yeah. but they they they, they put, left it on an empty pulpit yeah. while yeah. Uh, Bernie Sanders was yeah. pouring his heart yeah. out. And uh, my understanding is that 77 percent of the primary uh, went to Donald Trump and maybe two percent to Bernie Sanders. Does that sound like a? No, uh, well, I don't know. I don't know about the numbers, but if, you know, those people who those of us who've been around long enough to remember this uh, might liken it to. Uh, the O.J. Simpson trial, <laughs> when Bill Clinton, uh, President Bill Clinton, was giving a major speech, and they interrupted it to uh, report the results of the O.J. Simpson trial, and that's because ratings, public interest. You know, that's that's one of the uh, most difficult things to adjust to, and that is that uh, for most of your storied career as a writer and a journalist and an editor and and an educator, I might add, in in communications. Uh, it used to be that the media would deliver a product to the people and because they delivered such a fine product, the advertisers wanted to uh, kind of carry on with them so that they could expose their products to this, this uh, audience that was already out there. And now it seems like that the media is involved with bringing an audience to a product. That's true, and what a lot of people don't understand about the commercial television medium in particular is its history. That there was a time when the federal regulations required that uh, all the electronic media, radio and television, give a certain amount of time to public service. And in those days, they didn't even try to, to make money on it. They didn't try it. They didn't conceive of it as being profit making. They just did it as a public mm -hmm. obligation. Mm -hmm. That began to change. <coughs> probably in the Cronkite years, and then by the time Ronald Reagan became president, he and the, his, his, his uh, administration decided to throw those rules out. Now they gutted the Fairness Doctrine. You, you recall the Fairness Doctrine. So, and, and so now it's like, uh, it's just, it's, it's, er, anything is fair game. Uh, there's, there's nothing to restrict them. You, if you take a 30 minute newscast and you break it down, 
You take out the commercials, you got 22 minutes left. You take out the koala bears and the weather and the sports. <laughs> but pretty soon, you, all you've got left is 12 minutes, and they use up a bunch of that, especially in the local news, with episodic events about crime and, and accidents. And so you get very little real news from the television. And the, the audience doesn't understand that. They have to go to other sources if they really want to get news and information. And so that, that gives us the, uh, the rise of fake news. Talk, talk about that a little bit. Well, <clears throat> there's all sorts of definitions of fake news, of course. And uh, I mean, there's real fake news, which is satire. Like there's a, the Onion, there's the Borowitz Report. Uh, but you know going in that those are, that's right. are, are fake. And then the Saturday Night Live news right. update, well, you know that those are satire. The first time I saw Saturday Night Live, it fooled me. I thought that was a real newscast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, then there is fake news, which is often uh, propaganda. The, the key to propaganda is that good propaganda, good propaganda always uses some truth. Right. They just right. don't use the whole truth. They use only the parts of the truth that favor the argument that they want to uh, draw people to. John, I'm going to go out on a limb here a little bit and talk a little bit about our local daily paper and some fake news that came up here recently. Um, there was a request put in for the Opportunity Fund for $900,000 to go for the uh, site preparation for new construction for the uh, Peninsula Housing Authority to, to build some new homes. Well, uh, by the time it got to the newspaper, the newspaper said that this was going to be a $900,000 grant to construct a boys and girls club. And the uh, county had it on its agenda that this $900,000 grant was going to for, the, for the construction of a boys and girls club. So uh, how can that happen accidentally? You mean that the emphasis wasn't on what was actually happening? Right, the, 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 the money was actually going to go to tear down 33 right. homes right. And, and, and redo the site. Right. But, but it, it, got, it got listed in the daily paper, the Sunday paper before the Monday work session said it's going to go to the construction of a Boys and Girls Club. If, and, and, if, and it even was on the uh, official agenda that this was the purpose right. of that. If I'm a reporter, a news reporter, and then I, I was for 27 years, and uh, the sources that I usually deal with in, govern, in local government tell me X, Y, and Z, unless I can see, unless there's something obvious or somebody from another point of view clues me to the fact that there's something else going on, I'm probably going to present it the way they give it to me, the way they put it in my lap. And a lot of that goes on. It goes on locally. It goes on elsewhere. And I think that in this case, the uh, newspaper is just going along with the official line instead of reporting the fuller story. Uh, we're going to be right back with some more on this topic. So uh, be right back with uh, more of Now You Know and our special guest, Dr. John Mars, in just one minute. Hello and welcome back to Now You Know. I'm your host, Dale Wilson, and our special guest today is Dr. John Mars. Uh, we've been covering a lot of ground here, but one thing that came up during the break, and that is that uh, Dr. Mars is on the Peninsula College Foundation Board of Directors, and as all of you know or should know, there's going to be a, some new construction downtown soon for a performing arts center, and that's right up uh, the alley for the uh, Peninsula College Foundation. So, uh, John, tell us a little bit about that. Well, I am, uh, the foundation is the financial overseer of the project, but it's actually being uh, <clears throat> managed and put together by the Port Angeles Waterfront Center Committee, which was created according to the will of Donna Morris, who left about $10 million for this purpose. And then uh, another donor named Dorothy Fields, uh, who's very much alive, uh, donated the money, about a million and a half dollars, to buy the acreage at Oak and, uh, and Front Streets, mm -hmm. where, the, where the Performing Arts Center is going to be located. Now, I only know what's going on secondhand because I'm not on the Performing Arts Center committee, uh, which is doing all of the legwork. They're working with LMN Architects in Seattle, which is a very good architectural firm. They have determined so far that they don't need the full site for their plans, their probable plans for a performing arts center. Pr 
probably including some provisions for a convention center. I don't know to what scale. They've determined they don't need the whole site, so they've invited the Faro people, Faro Marine Life Center, to come on board and to use the site also. Terrific idea. Uh, there is also, and, and this is uh, this is very tentative because I don't, I have not heard that there has been any response, but uh, I understand that there's been an, an offer made to the uh, Elwha tribe in case they want to also participate on some level in some way. Great, great. I love so, to see that. So this could be a, a really uh, fantastic facility to, to tie, help tie together the tourism and the community in the in the downtown area. And build a lot of synchronicity with various groups in the community, so that would be terrific. Potentially, yes. Tell us about uh, Donna Morris. Uh, how did she make so much money to be able to give so much away? Uh, I don't know. Okay, okay. Because <laughs> uh, I want to get into that business if I can. Donna Morris, uh, uh, the, there are people who are, who are close to her who could tell you, but I have never, never heard the stories. All I know is she loved the performing arts. Mm -hmm. She had lived in Port Angeles for a while. She was a woman with means, and she decided to leave uh, funds to the college to establish a performing arts center. Now, the only, the one thing you'll note here is that her will was to establish a performing arts center only. So additional funds who are going to be needed for any conference center, any, any, any plans for the performing arts center that exceed her request and the Farrell Center. So there's going to be a lot of fundraising involved. And the committee is on top of that. Uh, and if you want, anybody who wants further information, they should contact um, Brooke Taylor because he's the chairman of the committee. Retired Judge Brooke Taylor. Right, that's right. John, let me ask you this, and uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really curious. I'm not trying to be uh, snarky, but is there a market for conferences here in Port Angeles? There have always been a certain number of conferences here in Port Angeles, and they have been at commercial venues. Uh, the commercial venues are limited. They're limited in size. Uh, some people have not been satisfied with the service at one of them. Uh, and so there's a potential. I don't know. That, that I can't speak for the committee. All I know is that the committee has not decided how large the theater venue will be. They haven't decided yet how large the convention center facilities might be. So that's all still in the works. Now, will this convention center include uh, hotel facilities? Or? No, it would include, uh, uh, potentially it would include meeting rooms and, con and kitchen facilities. All right, John, I, I see a conflict, uh, potential conflict right now. Uh, if there's a board that is involved with uh, bearing out the wishes of uh, Donna Morris to build a uh, performing arts center, and now they're trying to put a uh, conference center in on top of it, uh, isn't there a chance that one will grow to, to make the other one shrink or, or something along that line? You know, th this committee, the, the members of this committee are really substantial, uh, solid members of this community, and, and they won't let that happen. Uh, are, are the, the same uh, members, the same committee, uh, responsible for both the convention center and the performing arts center? Yes, I mean, it's, it's there. So it'll be one building or one one. Uh, well, development. If, if Farrell comes in, I, I, I'm assuming, I don't know this, I'm assuming that Farrell would be a separate building on the site because uh, that would not be that would not be part of a performing right, arts center. Right. Uh, well, those uh, those uh, mollusks do a lot of performing. That, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that uh, uh, Squid does a lot of performing. Uh, John, you've got so many things in this article that you talked about that, that we should be aware of. We're going to move back to, to local city politics. Uh, among them are, uh, let me put my glasses on here, uh, the possibility of lowering Peabody Creek to a daylight course, uh, partnering with the Ferro Marine to upgrade the downtown educational tourist attraction, uh, creating a public development authority uh, to remodel downtown business court. Those are some terrific ideas. Where do you get these ideas and what do you recommend? Well, we have a Peninsula Housing Authority and I don't know exactly what the, what the uh, mission of the Peninsula Housing Authority is, but we need some kind of an authority to, to deal with uh, in, in any way that there is a potential for public housing aid. Uh, we Right now in Port Angeles, if you want to rent a home, you are out of luck. Right. There's right. no rentals available. At any price? At almost any price. And the ones that are marginal in terms of their quality have 
are more expensive than they used to be because it's because that's the market condition. Um, so that's one place I think the city might possibly pursue courses of action that would be useful to citizens. Uh, the thing about the daylight, it's kind of a dream of mine. Uh, if, if you go to Spokane, Ashland, Oregon, San Antonio, Texas, San Luis Obispo, California, and you go to their downtowns, the thing that draws people down there is their water courses going through the center of those communities. And we have one here that's covered up with asphalt. And so it would be expensive. The downtown people would uh, have to make some, be flexible. But Peabody Creek could be exposed to daylight, have a couple of bridges over it for the streets, and, uh, and change the nature of that part of the community in a way that would create a park-like atmosphere. And I think that could be a, a great <coughs> boon to this What well, comes to mind is uh, Austin's uh, downtown riverfront, that, uh, That's right. that uh, huge uh, tourist attraction. Right. Everybody I've ever spoken to about Austin brings that particular uh, attraction up. Now, I have seen some early pictures of Port Angeles, where uh, Peabody Creek came right on down the middle yeah. of the street, but I don't think that's exactly what you're talking no, about. No, Because they would come out and uh, put the smoke yeah, right, water yeah. in. <laughs> that's not the same thing, I'm sure. Uh, what ideas have you heard and that you like about the possible repurposing of the Rayonier property? Well, I mean, we have it hasn't been in, hasn't been in public discussion for a long time now. Um, out of sight, out of mind. Right, and it's several years ago when the Harbor Works controversy was going on. There, most of the discussion had to do with the possibility of creating a, uh, a native uh, village site or something mm -hmm. like that. And the native, the tribe is very much interested uh, and vested in, in the possibilities for that site. But I don't know what, I don't know what the possibilities are now. You know, Michael Gentry, uh, a local architect, uh, drew a, a very impressive uh, architectural rendition, rendition or rendering of what that could look like with right. a place for yeah. cruise ships to come yeah. up, yeah. Uh, maybe a little monorail yeah. to, to get up and back and forth yeah. downtown. Uh, it was very impressive, right. and, and it would repurpose the entire area. Yeah. Uh, it seems like to me, and this is just in the back of my mind, that there are uh, factions who uh, disagree on how it should be repurposed, and until they can get in a room and agree, there'll be nothing done there. Until a decision is made about cleaning up the site, which involves the State Department of Ecology and the Rainier Corporation, and I think the Elwha tribe, nothing's going to happen. Are you familiar with the, uh, you've been to Astoria, I'm sure. Astoria. No, Oregon. I haven't. Okay. I've never been to Astoria. There's a place right downtown uh, on the uh, Columbia River waterfront, and it was, I think it's called the Brownstone Project, that had almost exactly the same set of situations where there was a paper mill there, all of the same mm -hmm. uh, dioxins and pencils and everything that were in the ground at, at Rainier were in the ground there. And it was, it laid uh, barren for years because nobody could agree how to repurpose right. it. Well, a, a very daring developer got the city, the county, the state, and the feds all in one room and said, where, where does my stop loss stop? And they told him, put six inches of clay over this and you're good to go. Now those homes are selling there for $350,000, $400,000 yeah. a piece, and the lots alone are selling for $100,000, most beautiful lots right down on the waterfront. And, and I don't see why that couldn't be I, happening I, here. I, I, I'm su I, I suspect that right now, the people involved in politics in the city are afraid to get involved in Rainier uh, because the Harbor Works thing left us a, a, a stain. The har there was a whole bunch of money wasted on the Harbor Works. You and, don't mean it. And, <laughs> and so the politicians are reluctant to get involved in that again. Something's got to eventually break through, and I suspect at least at this time, in the context of, the, of this time, I don't think it'll happen unless Rainier does something, unless Rainier says we're ready to do something. Another topic you discussed was the, uh, the change in uh, city's prosecution of misdemeanor crimes. Uh, until uh, the beginning of this year, uh, SWIM would prosecute their own misdemeanors in district court, the Port Angeles would prosecute their own, uh, and Forks, of course, still does prosecute their own misdemeanor cases. Uh, in 2000s, the beginning of this year, uh, those duties, SWIM and Port Angeles both turned those duties over to the county prosecutor to uh, prosecute all misdemeanors and uh, felonies. Uh, and as far as your outlook, how is that working and, and uh, do you think it was a good idea? Well, I don't know. I, I don't feel like I'm 
up to speed on that topic. Uh, I've had a couple of conversations with the uh, with Mark Nichols, the county prosecutor, but not specifically about that. Uh, I think that the the argument that is there to be made has to do with whether people think that the county prosecutor and his office will handle those cases well. Well, oddly enough, even before I read your your article, uh, I made an inquiry to a public records request to determine uh, the difference and. Uh, the, the request I asked for was how many uh, cases have been referred to you by either the police department or the sheriff's department uh, after they've done a, an exhaustive investigation and they suggested that you prosecute these people, how many have you declined to prosecute? And it's up almost to 100 now. So, what uh, kind of, see, but then you, it's, it gets complicated. I know, I don't what know kind what was before, yeah. Are they just drug cases? I mean, and I, and I mean that when I say just drug cases. Right. Uh, Some of them are he said, she said, domestics, which I agree that you can right. get, get nowhere with them. So, it's, so there's a whole, <clears throat> every prosecuting office has to make decisions about what cases are worth pursuing. And I don't want to get involved in that thicket because I'm, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not qualified. Uh, well, as you might guess, I have read some of the police reports that, that uh, surround those cases and, uh, you know, from, from a pedestrian uh, sitting uh, Monday morning quarterbacking, it looks like some of them are slam dunk and didn't get yeah, well. prosecuted. For instance, uh, these three, uh, we'll call them vigilantes, that went in on a homeless right. camp up here right. behind right. the uh, Fresh Walk and, and tumbled their camp and threw their food. Uh, in the interview with the police, they admitted everything that it would take to, to, to yeah, I think, get a, get a conviction. But uh, I, they, they failed to prosecute. I, I would understand. I, I would agree that I don't. I don't understand why a case like that would not be prosecuted. Well, John, we're going to have to leave it right there, and we'll have to settle these things next time we get together. Okay. I sure have enjoyed your visit, okay. right. and I hope we can do this more often. Okay, thank uh, you. I enjoy this a lot, and I learn a lot from you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our guest today, Dr. John Mars, longtime educator, editor, journalist, and uh, just a really good pundit for local politics. And this is Dale Wilson, your host for Now You Know, uh, videotaping here in sunny downtown Port Angeles at Papa Studios. Thanks for watching. We'll be back with another episode real soon. Thank you.